This morning, our scripture lesson comes to us from the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. We'll begin reading in the 32nd verse. For those of you that received your third grade Bible, that can be found on page 249 in your Bible. Oh, hey, Butch got it. All right. Well, I'm not going to throw Okay, you've already got your candy bar. Good. I won't throw you one. All right. Well, this morning, uh, if you want to turn, those of you with third grade Bibles, 249, I think Jamie said it's actually the red bookmark in your Bible this morning. So that'll take you right to it. In our reading, we hear, David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you're just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them since he has defiled the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're not going to ask for a show of hands in this moment. But how many of you are ever anxious or afraid? And don't give each other the all-knowing glance because you know the person you're seated with is the one who's more anxious or afraid than you are, usually. If you're a person who is not anxious or afraid, then in today's world, you're really the exception to the way the norm is. A recent study revealed that nowadays, Americans say that they are anxious about their health, about safety, about finances, about politics, and about relationships. I mean, that's a lot. And of course, when we're anxious, when, when we're afraid, when, we're, when we fear things, we usually don't think as well as we should. And we don't concentrate as well as we could. And, and we can even experience a bit of paralysis, not knowing what to do. And we can become angry. And we can even become more judgmental of others just because we're anxious or we're afraid or we're fearful. Today, we're, we're talking about changing our world and changing the world through faith. And we're continuing to look at the, the story of David. And today's passage, this story, is probably one of the most familiar stories of David. The first time I remember hearing this story was in Sunday school as a kid. I remember that I, I drank high C out of little Dixie cups, and I had those little daisy-shaped cookies on my finger eating it. Because if you have a daisy-shaped cookie, you put it on your finger to eat it. And I was at East Gadsden Methodist, and our Sunday school teacher was employing the greatest modern technology that anything of, of any that we had ever seen to teach me this story, felt board, you know, little felt cutouts of David and Goliath and popping those up on that felt board to, to show me this story. And I remember being captivated by the story of David and Goliath. And I still remember sitting in that room and hearing it for the first time. You see, the story of David and Goliath takes place in the Valley of Elah. And that's just on the edge of the mountains in the foothills in the southern area of Israel, down near Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And it involved the Israelites and the Philistines. And the Philistines were this warrior people who lived on the plains over by the Mediterranean Sea. But every so often they would come inland. And whenever they would travel into the main part of Israel and they would run into the Israelites, conflict would always occur. And the Philistines, well, they were a physically big people compared to the Israelites. And the biggest of them all was Goliath. 
Goliath was their chief warrior. And so in this story, there's a confrontation between the Philistines and the Israelites. And and every day at the battlefield, Goliath would step out onto the battlefield and he would begin yelling and teasing the Israelite people, trying to call them out into war. And here's what the scripture says in chapter 17. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, would step out onto, onto, from his lines and he would shout his defiance. And David heard it. And whenever the Israelites saw him, they all fled from him in great fear. All he had to do was yell, and they were anxious, and they were afraid, and they ran away. So how do we change our world? How do we change our world that can be filled with fear and anxiety like we're reading about here? How can we change our world in the bigger world that that sees fear and anxiety on the rise People anxious about anything and everything nowadays. Well, I think the answer is what it's always been. And that is, we can live as a person of faith. Even in the midst of anxiety. It helps us to face it. We can share a message of faith. In a world that's afraid. Because that can help them. All around us are the effects of fear and anxiety and the darkness that they bring. And that that part of our world and, and that part of the world needs the power of the light of faith to be shined brightly so that we can see through that darkness. And we can find the we can find hope in the midst of that anxious and fearful world. I've heard it said, and I truly believe it's true, that there's not enough darkness in the world to snuff out the light of one small candle. We can change our world because we, we can be that one small candle that shines the light of faith into the darkness of fear and anxiety. We can be that candle and nothing can put it out. So back to the story. Every day, twice a day actually, twice a day, Goliath, who remember I said he was the tallest of all the Philistines, Goliath was nine and a half feet tall. And he wore armor that weighed 125 pounds. And twice a day he would step out onto the battlefield and he would yell, send me your best person trying to call them out to fight. And all of the soldiers in in the armies of Saul, they would respond with complete silence. Nothing to say. Everyone staring at their feet. Everyone slowly backing up away from the man who's yelling. It, it reminds me, every time I read that, it reminds me of the, the scene in Christmas Vacation when Clark Griswold first gathers his family out on the front lawn and he's going to light up his house with all the thousands and thousands of lights and he plugs it up and absolutely nothing happens. And he decides that he has to check every one of those thousands upon thousands of lights one bulb at a time until he finds the one that's burned out. He asked his son Rusty if he will help, if he'll stay out in the cold, if he will help him go through one light by by light. And Rusty starts backing up away from him, looking at an imaginary watch on his wrist and saying, whoa, geez, look at the time. I got to get to bed and brush my teeth and feed the hogs and do the laundry and wash the car, and I still got some homework to do, backing away little by little until he could get away and get back in the house. 
In a way, that's every soldier in King Saul's army. They're all paralyzed with fear. They're all backing away. They're all going, whoa, look at the time. He wants somebody to come out and fight. I, I couldn't really couldn't squeeze that in today. Filled with fear and anxiety because of what's right in front of them. Over the years, when, when our kids were growing up, in our house, Michelle was the one who always kept things going still does. You know, always she was the one that knew the answers to the questions that the kids were asking and, and she knew how to handle each one of them based off of their personalities or needs and she knew what to do and she knew how to handle everything and balance all of it, keep all the plates spinning. But every so often as the kids were growing up, there would be that occasional moment when she would need to go somewhere. Maybe for just to run to the store, or maybe it was for an evening, or maybe for a day, or maybe out of town on a trip. And in those moments, it was up to me. And I was a lot like the armies of Saul in the face of Goliath, frozen in fear and anxiety. By the time she came home, the, the house was always turned upside down. There was one to three kids crying, or sulking, or hungry, or a combination of all of those things. And she would ask me nicely, what happened? And my answer usually started the same way. I really thought I had it this time. I had a plan. I was working my plan. It was going great. And then you pulled out of the driveway and things just fell apart and I didn't know what to do. See, that's a little bit of Saul's army. Saul's army had a plan. They were going to go into battle. They were going to defeat the Philistines. But then this soldier pops out named Goliath and challenges them. And they're afraid. They're frozen with fear. And here comes David. And David's not backing down. The soldiers are saying to each other, you know, somebody ought to go out there and fight that guy. That, that, that approach sounds familiar, doesn't it? the somebody ought to approach? I mean, how many times when a problem pops up or there's a challenge to be faced or there's an issue to be solved, we think to ourselves or we say to others around us, somebody ought to go deal with that. Somebody ought to do something. Somebody ought to say something. Somebody ought to try something. David steps up and says, I'm that somebody. He says, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. But of course, when he takes that step of faith, Saul immediately says to him, you're not able to go and fight that Philistine. You're just a boy. He's been a warrior since his youth. David has the faith to step out. To be that somebody, to move out of the paralysis and, and to go and to do something. And the first thing he hears is, you can't do it. You won't make a difference. You're not good enough. You're not experienced enough. You're not old enough. Whatever the not enough is, you aren't. Before David can fight Goliath, he has to fight the naysayers in the story. And isn't that the way it often is? Sometimes the naysayers are other people, and, and sometimes the naysayers are the voices inside our own head saying to us, you can't do this. You can't fix this. The needs are too many. You're just one person. Don't waste your time. David is for us and for all people the poster child for one person with faith can make a difference. Remember, later on in Scripture, Jesus talks about this very thing. Jesus talks about how the kingdom of God grows from, from small acts and from small things like a mustard seed. A mustard seed that grows massive or, or five loaves and two fish that feed 5,000 people. Or how about disciples from rural Israel who grow up to change the world? And here in this story, a small stone that could bring down a giant. 
There might be naysayers and, and people that are paralyzed with fear and anxiety, but David has the faith. And he says to Saul, you know, I used to keep sheep for my master, for my father. There were lions, there were bears, and they, they would attack the sheep. And I would fight them off. And I'll do the same for the, to this Philistine. And listen to this word of faith. The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me now. And you know how the story goes. David, he takes his shepherd's staff and, and he takes his slingshot and five smooth stones from the creek. And Goliath sees him coming, walking out on the battlefield. And Goliath begins to ridicule him, begins to mock him. And David doesn't back down. Goliath becomes angry because David doesn't seem to be afraid, and, and he starts walking toward David. Remember, he's nine and a half feet tall. He's wearing 125 pounds of armor. He has a bronze sword. He has a spear that's so large, the spearhead is 15 pounds. And David... Well, David refused to wear Saul's ar armor because it weighed too much and he was too little. And so he didn't do that. And it's just him with a staff and a sling. And as he sees Goliath walking out toward him, David takes off from the safety of the Israelite army and he begins running toward the giant. And he reaches into the pouch and he takes out one smooth stone and puts it in the sling and begins to sling that around and sends it flying. And one small stone caused the giant to crash face down into the dirt. And when Goliath was dead, the Philistine army scattered, running for their lives. Remember what David said. The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and saved me from the paw of the bear will save me now. David knew that he could defeat the giant because God was with him. There's a lesson that we need to learn from this moment in David's life and, and from the Israelite people as a whole. Every year at Passover, the Jewish people remember how God, with a mighty arm and an outstretched hand, brought them out of the land of Egypt and brought them back into the land of Israel. David, in this moment, remembers when he was faced with challenges in the past, how God was with him. We should take time to remember what God has already done in our lives. Because that will give us the confidence and the faith today to change our lives and to change our world. As we celebrate the great things God has done for us, the faithfulness of God becomes ingrained in us and we remember that God is always with us and God is always faithful. God has been with us in the challenges in the past and we can have faith that God will be with us in whatever challenges come in the future. If you haven't ever done it, I, I would encourage you to to take time and look across your life and see how God has been faithful. Now, it's a humbling thing to do that, to look across your life and, and have to admit that you're not the solo author of your story. But instead, look back and ask yourself questions like, where have I seen God work in my life? What doors has God opened for me? Who has God placed in my life at, at critical moments? And where have I seen that Old Testament passage that said what they intended for evil, God intended for good? Where have I seen that play out in my life? And how has God blessed me? And how has God used me to bless others? Remembering God's faithfulness in the past helps us to have faith today. When we face fear and anxiety, it helps us to have faith today to change our life, to change our world. David put his faith in the God who had always been faithful. And so can we. Remember that great verse that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome while he was staying in Corinth. 
He said, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who can separate us from the love of God? Can distress or peril or nakedness or famine or the sword? No. I am sure, I'm sure then that in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God who has been faithful to us in the past is faithful to us in the present and will be faithful to us in the future. We can change our lives and and we can change our world and we can even change the world when we live by faith and not by fear. So how can you change your world today by shining that light of faith in whatever fear and anxiety you face knowing that God is with you? How can you shine that light of faith in the lives of the people around you, helping them to understand whatever they're facing, whatever they're dealing with, that God is faithful to them and God will be with them. All they have to do is ask. How can you change your world today by remembering that God has been faithful in the past, God is faithful right now, and God will be faithful in the future? How can you let that change your world even today? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning, our our closing hymn is number 15, O God, Our Help in Ages Past, a wonderful reminder of the faithfulness of our God. I invite you now to stand as we sing together.